we're doing HDMI. Sorry, this is HDMI, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, and with that, uh, Ram Chandran will be giving our next talk on randomized sketching. Hi, guys. Uh, Ram Chandran, I'm currently a graduate student at Hopkins. I'm currently a graduate student at Hopkins. And uh, this was based out of work that I did in the past two years at Cornell. And I realized that it's been a long day, and apparently the talk after we got canceled, so maybe I can just go on forever. <laughs> but maybe not. Okay, so since, it's, since it's, it is the end of the day, so I just want to impress two things uh, on the list, uh, audience. If you have data that you're using in your scientific computations of various forms that is bulky, and you just cannot seem to get a, like, able to shed the weight, perhaps you would consider uh, matrix approximation. Well, duh. Yes, everyone does matrix approximation. But specifically, uh, hopefully randomized sketching. Randomized sketching is a low-rank matrix approximation that particularly works well when your data is acquired in slices and you don't just need to have the entire data at once. That's one. So if you have data that's bulky, you should probably try to use this to just to reduce the memory footprint. Two, if you're using computing gradients on top of this bulky data, then this is still going to do really well for you, where you can compute approximate gradient at a much lower memory footprint. Anyway, so with that, I'll start my talk. So typically, uh, the one use case that, I, that we found in our research was these flow control problems. These monstrous, these monstrous problems are basically like, there's a fluid that's flowing across a cylinder, and you want to control the flow. So the way that this works out is you mathematically model the fluid flow equations. You have to discretize the domain. Your control action is the cylinder, so if you turn the cylinder really hard, then like, that affects how the fluid flows. That all, that's all fine, but the state here is the velocity field, and to get any meaningful result, you need really good, precise mesh, and, that, and you have to store the value of your velocity field at each of those points, and that quickly becomes very infeasible. So even for like a very small example that we were running with, for synthetic example, it was like 2,000 cross 1,000. And you can imagine that doing optimization on this is not fun. Uh, second for example, full waveform inversion. So basically, in this case, uh, people are uh, sending probes of waves uh, through the ground, and they, ref they measure how it, what they uh, see on sensors that is placed on the ground. And the idea is that you want to figure out the subsurface composition. And the way that the light gets refracted and reflected gives you information about this. Again, you have to discretize your continuous space. And that turns out to be that you approximately, in this case, you need to store 64 billion spatial points. That is huge. You do not want to be running gradient descent or anything that's, and you, you, can, you can forget things, like trying to run anything that's second order. So these, these are the problems and the size of the problems that we're working with. And we want to reduce this memory. Okay, so storage uh, is the elephant in the room here, and uh, you can also think that if even even if your storage, even if you have algorithms that are really go that works really well for GPUs and parallel processing, there's a lot of like time that goes into like transferring data into and out of like secondary memory sources, and that is still going to be more expensive than if you could just fit it into your uh, massive but still limited core. Okay, so the most the most conventional ways of like tackling this is that uh, you first like throw away a bunch of data and then you say, hey, I'll just recompute the data that I threw away. Like if you if this data is like across time, and say it's zero to ten, typically what people do is okay, let's take these four points and then only store the data at those points and then we'll recompute forward whenever we require. That's checkpointing, and second is that let's let's make let's make the grid coarser. And perhaps that will still, uh, th theoretically, we could still prove that it's a good grid. But this is, th this is still like tailor-made analysis. And what we think you should, you, should, you should ideally try is randomized sketching. And 
it doesn't you don't need to trade in your computations for trade in your storage for computations and you don't need any tailor made analysis you could just plug it in and try and if it doesn't work out it doesn't work out but if your data is going if it has any sort of rank structure this is probably working out okay so what is this uh, randomized sketching so you have a matrix a and you want to decompose it into two factors uh, two low rank uh, ideally factors and uh, we also assuming that the data is presented in slices, like I said in the beginning. So you don't know, you don't just have all the matrix, the entire matrix at one at one go. So imagine time series data. So you get like you get it one one day at a time or one time unit at uh, at a time. So if you are processing, if your approximation for this matrix works on those slices rather than requiring the entire data before you start doing your compression, that's going to give you some uh, computational advantage. So it's a simple procedure. You have a matrix. You run a randomized projection to capture the range of this matrix. You, run, you do another randomized projection to capture the co-range of the matrix. And then you do a third randomized projection to capture the, how the co-range space and the range space interact. So ideally, what information does your matrix give you? Your matrix really tells you what the columns do, what the rows do, and how they interact with each other. So, if you, if you have a randomized projection, and if you sus suspect that your data is low rank, and uh, so what this typically does is it captures the column space. So once you have a rough idea of the column space, later on you could like run QR decompositions to get a basis, and then reconstruct a, a low rank version approximation to your matrix out of these sketches. So, so this is what I said, yeah, the column space, the row space, so, and if you were present, and you, you could do these random projections with columns. Suppose you presented with just column by column, you could like multiply it with this random matrix and like suc successively build your uh, image of the column space. Okay, so the storage, uh, storage in this case, instead of being uh, M cross N of a M cross N matrix is now R into N plus N plus R squared, where R is a rank parameter. Which, is, which works really well if, if it is low rank, which is meaningless if it's, a, if it's not low rank, if it's high rank, but it's still something. And uh, okay, so if you have these sketches, you could compute QR decompositions and then have a reconstruction that, as, as given over there. Okay, you can find more information in paper that I'll upload the slides and there are references, but I want you to just know that this, is, this can be done uh, on the go. Okay, and uh, the there's a theorem that says that, hey, this is good enough that this is going to give you an approximation that is equal equivalent to the best rank R approximation. So the best rank R approximation is really you compute an SVD of the matrix and you throw away the, the unnecessary singular values. This is, this, is, this is very, it's only a constant factor worse than that. And that's really good. That's a good guarantee. Okay, so... Optimization. What, so what I was working on originally was optimization, and how do you do this? Because in the flow control example, for example, it was really difficult to like make sure that to manage this data and to run an optimization that is that you can verifiably say, hey, uh, this is going on the right path. So uh, the a math, uh, just a mathematical formulation. We have an objective function. We have a constraint. The objective function and the constraint both have time-dependent structure. Typical, which is typical with many problems in dynamic optimization. Uh, all sorts of LQR, all sorts of optimal control problems sort of uh, can be whittled down into this framework. Even if it's a continuous, it's typically all the, all the, all the problems that you care about are kind of continuous in nature, but once you discretize it, and then you have a time-stepping or an integration scheme, it, this is actually what it turns out to. At least it's an abstract form that you could like whittle it down to. So, uh, yeah, so, so the point here is that uh, you, so in the velocity field, the, the U's here are the state, the velocity. The way that you compute the gradients, which is G, is that there is this data dependency where you have to compute the state forward in time, and then compute the Lagrange multipliers backward in time, and then compute the gradient. So if, you, if, you're, if your sketching can do access, uh, can do compression on the go. So you can compress a state matrix forward in time and execute this computation graph with a much lesser memory footprint. This is, you can just look at this as a computation graph, and we are not, the question is, what do you actually have to store? And I'm telling you that you don't need to store all of those U's, you just need to store a compressed version of it, and that is enough to store, give an approximate gradient. 
And we've run an experiment uh, on the toy example that I told you about flow control. And so in that case, the matrix size was 2,000 cross uh, 800, 2,500 cross 800, the rank is 800. And you can see what it looks like. So the first, the first row is really is what it looks like initially when you start off from a random point. You, you just stimulate the Navier-Stokes equation, and you see what works out. And it, you can see that it's a turbulent uh, flow. The, the flow is not ideal. You want to control the velocity field. And this is what happens after you run it uh, for a time period of 0 to 20, which is broken down into time steps. So this is pretty good uh, control. And uh, so this is a, a, a table of our experiment. And on the leftmost column, you can see that there's a rank. So that is really telling you what the rank parameter that you feed into this is. As I told you, it was 800. But even with rank 32 over there, you, you, you can see that the performance, the objective function is, the objective value is, is optimal. And you have, you have 10 times the compression factor, and you are not doing much more computation. So if you can get away with it, you should probably get away with it. And that's my question. That, that's my talk. Thank you for coming to my talk. I was just wondering, what's the flow control mechanism you you were implementing there? Uh, what do you mean by mechanism here? Because yeah, because you were controlling the flow, right? So yeah. you you had to implement some kind of boundary condition or something, right, on the cylinder? Yeah. So the the control action there is the angular velocity of the cylinder. Okay. 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 Yeah. So have you tried doing this on a continuous time adjoint, and then maybe? think about adding it to like diffuse sensitivity to help out all the other things? Like, uh, what, what exactly would need to be done to, uh, with the algorithm to change it to be possible there? To the, sorry, repeat. To the that. continuous time adjoints, right? Well, uh, uh, the way I see it, you, you, you don't need to add anything to the analysis. As long as, I mean, as long as you have uh, a, point where, a point in your code where you are generating a vector and then you're storing that vector, this would just like swap in storing the operation of storing for like a randomized projection and storing the randomized projection. Mm -hmm. So you don't actually need to do anything theoretical, at least on the first go to see whether it works. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, so, so coding, you, you probably need, will, will need to think a little bit because uh, it requires on like what would you, what you would. So in all of, in all of these cases, at, at a later point, you only need to access one column at a time or one row at a time, and hence the reconstruction is easy. You don't, you don't ever need to reconstruct the entire matrix. So if that is the case, even in, in, in this hypothetical example, then you should be good, hopefully. Yeah. It's not so simple as that, but. OK, uh, yes, you can go ahead. I, I, don't want to, I have a question. Uh, uh, so essentially, this is almost like video compression, right? So you have a bunch of frames. Uh, a, a, a bunch of I images that you try your time slices, and, the, and then you're trying to form a compressed representation of yes. that. So how does this kind of thing, I mean, compare to just if you, the traditional video compression type of things? Like if you, do, if you just do a DCT, a three-dimensional DCT in blocks and throw away the, 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 low, the low amplitude components or some other algorithm that's used for video. Like, so uh, first off, uh, we haven't really worked with any sort of video data because there's all sorts of uh, issues like uh, color channels and how you do the, the compression across the color channels. but. So that the the video compression like are really they are they are a compression at the level they're not linear algebraic in in a you sense. Don't need it, you don't need it to be linear algebraic, right? You, sure. You, you just need a compressed representation of this data. And sure. Uh, th th that's an interesting that's an interesting thought experiment. So in our case, we worked with scientific simulations, so it made more it made more sense to use these compression formats rather than to use uh, a JPEG compression. Well, no, you wouldn't use literally JPEG, right? I'm, I'm just saying the same kind of thing. So. It, in, in, in video, in JPEG, right, you divide into blocks and do a DCT and throw away the small amplitude components. Yes. Uh, you can easily apply the same thing to floating point data. It doesn't have to be image quantized. Yes. Right? So, uh, the short, long answer is that I haven't done it on videos, but I have done it on scientific simulations so like flow control, and it, this works better for flow control. But it makes sense to me that this works better because better we have an idea of, like, 
the data should be low rank, and then we have like a more control over how we would do this. Uh, you, you're saying it works better. It works better than doing nothing, right? You haven't. You, you haven't. You, you, you no, there are papers. There are papers that literally that literally just take out all for, all forms of data compression because it's a terrible pro data storage is a terrible thing. So they literally base compression techniques that you would find in uh, in any other computer graphic world, and. The performance in those are not good, and typically the community moved away from it because they were not good. So, and ours does comparable to the what current, current currently uses. Okay, I think I should go. All right. Thank you. Yeah.